All right. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Nick Lutz, and I'm here to talk to you about structures. Uh, who is at the New Orleans class? All right. I wasn't. I was the guy on the call because I had COVID. Uh, I'm here this time, no COVID. Uh, but some of this you'll see a little bit of a peak because not everyone was there, but I'll try to burn through some of the basics and focus on where your structure inventory integrates with LifeSim for the most part. All right, so main goals of this, just to kind of give you that overview of what structure inventories are, how they interact with LifeSim, uh, recognize some of the common attributes we put into structure inventories and uh, some of the common issues that come up with your structure inventories. So in general, why are we concerned about structure inventories? Hey, we're studying dam fillers. Do we really need to focus that much on these structures? And the answer is yes. Uh, I mean, we just talked about the hazards portion of it, right? Uh, if you're engineers, you probably spend most of your career thinking about the performance side of things, like how well does the levee protect? How well does the dam protect from flooding? Uh, but none of that matters if there's no people downstream of your dam or behind that levee, right? You know the risk is going to be zero if there's no one's there, there's no crops there, there's no et cetera there. Uh, so we need to know how many people are in that protected area, protected area. Uh, and, and how susceptible they are to harm. You know, 100 people behind the levee can look a lot different if they're all in mobile homes and if they're all in one, you know, 10 story skyscraper or whatever. Uh, so you have to have those sort of details of how many people are in there and how vulnerable they are to flooding. So where do you start? Uh, well, you want to have an idea of what area of interest you, you have, right? So you would want some sort of RAS type output to say, hey, here's my study area, here's the potentially inundated area. So now I know I need to gather information on structures within that polygon. You might want to buffer that a little bit because, you know, Brendan might come back to you a week later and said, hey, I changed the roughness coefficient and now you want to look at this wider area or something like that. So you don't want to have to go back and redo it. Uh, you might also be interested in some of the surrounding areas because maybe you also are concerned about shadow evacuation of people evacuating outside the inundated area and clogging up the roadways and things like that. So it's a good idea to generally have a buffer around what is actually flooded. And then you can start by pulling down the National Structure Inventory, the NSI, um, but you can also make adjustments to that NSI. And I'll talk about what the NSI is if you haven't heard of that before, but we generally encourage, you know, the higher level of study you're doing, the more adjustments you want to make to your base inventory. Uh, the, the more you want to check its assumptions and make adjustments for special structures within the inventory, et cetera. Uh, so what are those attributes? Uh, the first attribute we can consider is like, hey, what is the structure used for? Is it a residence? Is it a single family home? Is it a multifamily home? Is it a hotel? Is it a retail shop? All that is generally going to be uh, included in what we call the occupancy type. And here's some example, you know, res one, res three, that just means single family or multifamily home. The NSI, uh, again, the kind of the most commonly used, at least within the core structure inventory group, we use the HAZIS, this is a FEMA program uh, classification. So there's like 40 or so different occupancy types that break it down for different residential and commercial uses. And where this comes into play with license, Uh, and then it's going to have other sorts of things. So, you know, what you mentioned earlier that you can play around and license about your evacuating size, your evacuating group size, that is all done at the occupancy type level. So if you wanted to, you could say, okay, people evacuate from multifamily structures and three person groups, but I'm going to change the school uh, uh, evacuating size to be 30 instead of three. Maybe you're assuming they're evacuating in buses or something like that. You know, there is that level of customization you can do. And a lot of that is done at that sort of level. Next is the building type. So if a flood comes through, uh, the consequences of that flood are going to be different. Again, if you're in a wood frame home or engineered foam, uh, sorry, uh, engineered structure, potentially, right? You know, your engineered structures, your steel structures are generally going to be able to withstand uh, higher velocities and depths than your wood frame homes. So it's important to have that information embedded in your structure inventory as well. Um, and then also that could have some impact on structure valuation as well too. Uh, if you're doing an economic study, you know, your key attribute is going to be the value you assume that structure is worth. 
uh, within the core, we're usually interested in depreciated replacement value. So this would say, okay, the, the picture on the top where this home is starting to fall apart, uh, we want to account for the fact that that's, that's not worth as much as the picture on the bottom, the same house, but now remodeled. Uh, you know, you, you would have less of a loss of the nation at the top picture with flooded than the bottom picture with flooded, right? And so we try to, calc uh, to account for that within our depreciated replacement value. Uh, replacement value is usually going to be based off of some sort of dollar per square foot, and then you have a square foot estimate, hopefully, in your structure as well, and then you can come up with a, some sort of cost there. Different ways to do it uh, that might be appropriate depending on the guidance that your agency or customer uses. Uh, foundation type. So this is obviously going to be important because if you're the high your home or your structure is built off the ground, uh, the would actually, uh, you know, what, what would they see? What, would, what kind of forces would they expect? So again, 10 foot, flo 10 foot flood, one foot foundation height, what would be the depth within that structure? Did I hear a nine? Yeah, so, you know, pretty simple math, right? 10 minus one. So according to like first floor elevation, you get nine feet above that first floor elevation. So what if you're in the structure at the top and your home is built eight feet off the ground, now what would the people inside, what would they be exposed to? Two, yeah. So 10 minus eight, now you get two feet of, uh, of depth. So this is gonna be, if you're in a coastal area where this type of foundation type, your top right image is more common, this would have a huge impact on your consequences, right? So if you're in a coastal flooding situation, this is when it becomes a lot more important. But still, you know, depending on the depth and velocity in your area, you know, even just moving from an average of one foot to an average of three foot could significantly impact. So population. So if you're doing a life loss study, which we're most, you know, obviously focused on this course, uh, your population, not your structure value, is going to be your main field of interest. And that is generally, you know, put as an attribute within your structure inventory. So you want to know how many people are they and what's that breakdown uh, for day and for night. Again, because people are more in their homes at night and more at their workplaces and shopping and stuff like that during the day. But we're also interested in the age of that population. So disability rates we mentioned, that is uh, people with disabilities are are treated differently within the model. We assume that they're less able to vertically evacuate, and that is highly correlated with the age of the population. So the older you are, the more likely you are to have that sort of ambulatory disability. So we break down that in the NSI to say, okay, here's your uh, 2 p.m. over 65, your 2 a.m. under 65, et cetera, four different groups. Uh, so LIFESIM can then take that information in and assign population to different fatality rates depending if they're exposed to the floodwaters. All right, so I mentioned the NSI a few times. Real quick overview of it. Uh, you know, when we started ramping up, we, the core, start ramping up our portfolio analyses. We realized, hey, we have a lot of dams and levees to study, and we don't have time to build custom inventories for them like, you know, the core economists have traditionally over the past decades. There's no time to drive around in your car, record structure attributes in a windshield. We need something we can take off the shelf, quickly go out and screen our dams. So this is what we came up with. It was basically, we first started using Hazus data. Again, this is a FEMA sort of product that had census block level information. And you would say, okay, let's well, I distribute these counts of structures at the census block across the census block area. And you get this big jumbled mess. You know, some versions like this 2015 version, we said, we're we'll limited to the developed areas that census block. And so it's not just dots across the entire census block. It's like where we think people are kind of building things, but still, Uh, we got better as we switched over to parser data, but we couldn't release those, this information to those outside the core. And we still had some issues like a lot of structures along roadways and things like that because a lot of data comes in geolocated by address and we weren't able to put those directly on top of building footprint. The most recent version of NSI, even more improvement. So now we generally will have dots on rooftops. And we want that because again, we're trying to pull in the hydraulic information from wherever that dot is located. And so if the street is one foot lower than the, where the building is truly located, that could impact your results. Uh, even more so if the, if the building is really located at the top of the hill and everything else is down here, you know, you don't want to just randomly assign your structural locations. It's important to have as accurate as possible. Yes? 
it is. If, if you uh, ignore me for the next 10 minutes, you could Google NSI, you say, so you probably come upon something that says like Confluence, National Structure Inventory, something like that. Uh, that was where all our documentation is located in there. There's you know, a couple links down. You can find our download website pretty easily. Uh, so you can download a geo package of it, or you know, you'll see in a moment, you can actually just import it directly into LiveSim. Uh, if you right click, and when your workshops will probably do this, you know, download from NSI, it'll just import it directly into your model for whatever polygon you give it. All right, so I'm not really going to explain what this is, but this is how we kind of generate the NSI. We have a lot of different inputs we're trying to bring in and take the best of what's available from all these different input data sets, building footprints, parcel data, uh, particular data sets on where hospitals and nursing homes are located, bring all this information together to try to say, here's where we think people are located at different times of day. Um, you know, that spatial location being the most critical and the most time intensive from our standpoint of, of how to generate this. If there's any questions on that, you know, happy to get into it during here or after class or something. But this is a basic summary of how we do it. So you can see like, okay, there's these little red polygons around it. That's generally the lot or the parcel boundary. You know, this comes from parcel data sets, counties go out, uh, tax assessors want to say, how much do we charge people on property taxes? So they collect some information like this. That's a great resource for us, um, but it gets complicated in situations like the top there. Here's one large polygon for a parcel that's multifamily homes. Uh, that parcel data is usually a lot more sparse. It might not tell you how many buildings are within that parcel. So we'll try to bring in things like building footprints to say, well, we, you know, we are other people generally uh, took aerial imagery and tried to recognize building footprints. And so now we can count like, okay, the building footprint data suggests there's eight buildings in this parcel. So we'll generate eight dots. You know, well, in this case, the building footprint didn't recognize that image that circled on the top there. So we didn't generate a structure. So that's the kind of limitation you might see in the NSI. Uh, we also won't generate things like what's happening there on the left. Those are detached garages. Uh, we try to focus on the primary residence for single family homes. We don't want to put people in their garages when a flood comes through. Uh, if you're doing a really intense economic study, that also means we're ignoring the value of those detached garages. Sorry. Uh, we're not entirely, again, going to miss everything that doesn't have building footprint though, because that example on the bottom right shows like, hey, even though there's no building footprint, we still have parts of data suggest the structure is there. So we'll generate a structure regardless. So again, there's a lot of this mixing and matching. There's a lot of what else going on in our kind of code to generate all this. Uh, one thing I'll also highlight here, we spend more time focusing on things, like I say, these high fall data sets, nursing homes, hospitals, again, these are highly vulnerable populations. So some structures, we don't try to go down to the you know, nth detail of saying, okay, yeah, I think I know exactly where this guy's gonna be or whatever. But we do try to focus on like, hey, these people are gonna have a hard time evacuating or if they get flooded, they are gonna have higher fatality rates than most of the people in the study area. So we try to put a little bit more detail in some of those nursing homes and hospitals and things like that. All right, so there's a question before about how to get the data. So again, to the left, here's our download page. You just click on a state, it'll download a geo package for the entire state. If you're like, I don't want an entire state, that's a lot of data. You can use our API if, if you are a little bit more advanced in that sort of tech thing to say, well, here's a bounding box for my study area, or here's a county I'm interested in. Uh, a guide to using our API is in our documentation page. Or again, you can just use a life sim to say, oh, I'm gonna direct download this for my study area, and that will allow you to do it as well. I think there are a few fields that if you download from our geo package or API, that won't get important into license because I think it's only pulling in what's really needed. So there's a few extra fields you can get from um, the public version if you download directly from us rather than through ISIM. Also, if you're a core employee or a federal employee with like FEMA or something, you can get even more fields. We have a private version that has some licensed data that we can't release to the general public, but that might be important. And you know, there's some extra things like here's what the raw data said. If you say, I don't really trust that your version was ground truth, I want to look at the raw data to and then I'm going to go out and give extra scrutiny to whatever fields weren't, you know, uh, direct ops, directly observed from some of your input data. That might help you if you're outside the core federal family. Again, sorry. Uh, documentation. Here's our documentation page that if you Google it, you should see. Again, it has information on the technical, what attributes are in there. Uh, it will have information on common issues, et cetera. Is that a five-minute warning? No. Okay, cool. 
All right. All right. So if you're importing uh, into life sim, here is a typical sort of mapping structure if you're not using the direct input. Uh, so if you have a shape file or something that you want to bring in, you would just go through and say, here's the field that license is looking for. Here's what's named in my input data set. You know, you don't have to use NSI. You can use whatever uh, data input you have. You can go through and either say, here's what maps or, hey, that field wasn't included in my structure inventory. I want you to assume some um, just generic values such as ground floor height. We don't have that in NSI right now. We just, you know, give you no information basically. So you would check that block, that box, and say, "Ah, oh, it's a nine for all of them." Uh, that works, but if you're, you know, say, really nine foot works for a lot of homes and everything, but this room is a lot taller than nine feet, right? So you, you can always go in there and edit if you have some critical structure or something, uh, and come up with, you know, more realistic values um, if you want to get into that level of detail. Uh, you also probably get more into this in the workshop, but you can then. Use attributes that are included in your structure inventory to try to say, here's how to match to stability criteria. Um, so you can use things like saying, there's a building type field in the NSI, uh, match everything that says it's in for masonry to the masonry stability criteria. Stability criteria, I think we'll get into pretty soon. Uh, so occupancy types, I mentioned how important this can be because a lot of things are held at the occupancy type level in, in life sim. So you can come in here and say, well, for this occupancy type, which it's hard to read, it's a res one single family structure, uh, there's foundation type uncertainty in LISM that you can match to in here. So you can say, uh, my inventory had an assumption that is one foot, but I'm going to come in here and create a triangular distribution or a normal distribution. And then you can now have uncertainty at that occupancy type level. Um, the, the same thing for structure value uh, and depth damage function. So again, if you're in an economic study, uh, this is going to be a critical sort of thing. You might have the most likely assumption that at five feet, my structure gets 50% damage or something like that. But usually you'd want to have some sort of uncertainty around that. Um, some of the curves within LifeSim will have that by default. Some of them will not. Evacuation parameters. So if you go to another tab, you can also see how this is handled. Uh, this is where you would say, okay, it's not three people from my evacuating group, it's 30. Uh, again, that's all stored at the occupancy type level. And submergence as well. So Woody mentioned this in his first lecture, how everything is built. Uh, you know, if you're an able bodied person, it's assumed that uh, life loss would be like a foot from the ceiling. You can come in here and adjust the for an occupancy type level. Um, maybe and things like the ability to evacuate an attic and things like that. If you, if you want to assume, sure, most single family homes have an attic, but not my local grocery store or something like that. Um, I'm going to assume there's no ability to get up to the roof or something if, if you want to. So, other options for inventories within LifeSim, uh, you can have multiple inventories. So, if you want to do your baseline inventory, but you can also have one for 50 years in the future. If you're saying, oh, my area is seeing a lot of development, I'm going to have the second inventory, and then I'm going to run and see how life loss would change with that increased population. You can do that. Uh, if you're doing some sort of alternative analysis and say, hey, uh, we're looking into raising the structures, we're going to put them all on pier or pile foundations, so you can modify your inventory and put that in and see how life loss changes. You can also uh, set up new simulations and say, well, I'm going to change uh, the age breakdown. Again, maybe you're looking 50 years in the future and say America is getting older, so I'm going to change how the age breakdown is, or you can go and change uh, the disability rates. Um, all this is possible within LISM. So structure stability, I'm going to try to burn through this a little bit faster. You know, this covered a little bit in the previous course. But you can see when you're importing, again, you set up rules, and there's lots of different ways you can set up those rules. You can set it to the exterior wall type or building type that's in your structure inventory, or you can say things like uh, any structure that's more than 10 stories, I'm going to assume, is engineered, or any structure that, uh, you know, has three people in it uh, and was built in 1929, I'm going to assume, you can set whatever rules you want um, within this sort of calculator if you have a reason to do so. So these show different stability uh, assignments. So if you have a, uh, this is a wood anchored home, you're going to have a certain uh, depth and velocity that's necessary before that structure is assumed collapsed. But if you have a buoyant light home, so it's not anchored to its foundation, 
then you would have a different depth and velocity. And generally, mobile homes, buoyant homes are going to have a lower threshold it takes before that structure is assumed collapsed. So you would want to make sure that this is a critical assumption. If, if you see a lot of depths and velocities within that uncertainty range, that you spend additional time refining this assumption within your inventory of what homes should be mapped to what criteria. So here's an engineered structure, and here is that uh, mobile home manufacturer structure. And you can take your time when you have uh, the slides to look through some of this. This is all, again, with generics you can look at in LISIM itself as you do some of your exercises. So common errors and adjustments. Uh, probably the most devastating thing you can do from your inventory director study is have a whole lot of structure sitting in the river. Uh, this was common in earlier versions of the NSI, where we were just kind of randomly distributing structures across your census blocks. Very common in those cases to have structures sitting in the river. You know, that should be pretty intuitive, but it means not only are they going to get very extreme depths and velocities, but they might also start in things that can happen there, right? Because people might not get the appropriate level of warning or a time to evacuate if they're placed incorrectly. So it's important to kind of look for some of those outliers and also look not only and say, okay, I'm going to go through and look for the highest depths in my study and make sure those structures are placed correctly, but also maybe just look through some of your more extreme areas and make sure you're not missing important structures. Like the image on the right, this is a high growth area. So there's growth that has occurred since the inventory was generated. So all those structures that are being built currently or have been built in recent years are going to be missed. So look again for your high potential consequence areas and make sure you have appropriate coverage um, when necessary. If you're doing an economic study, uh, again, put some thought into depreciation. We have assumptions based on the year that the structure is built, so how much you depreciate it, um, but that's you know fairly generic adjustment. Uh, it's important to, if you, again, if you have a few structures driving your analysis, to kind of look at those structures. Uh, again, foundation heights. We have generic assumptions that a slab foundation is going to have, be built a half a foot off the ground, and a pier foundation is going to be built eight feet off the ground. That may or not be appropriate depending on your regional area. Pier and pile foundations especially can vary pretty significantly, and the uncertainty around that height. Um, you know, one region may have a higher base flood elevation than the other, and people might build to whatever, you know, FEMA says they have to, but so they can not have insurance. So if you're, again, in that coastal area, especially, I would spend a lot of time for refining these foundation heights. And we have a tool, again, for those within the core at the moment. We can go, and go through, supply uh, a sample list of structures you want to look at, and hop around, go Google Street imagery for that XY location, and it'll take you to the image if it's available, and then you can record your attributes. If you're not within the core, it's fairly easy to do something similar. Just build an Excel spreadsheet with your XY location, so you can plug that into Google. And, you know that's a lot more uh, a lot more time savings than you know what we used to do within the core. We're just driving around physically. Uh, here, if, even if you're working on a study across the country, Google Street View is a great resource. Uh, simple best practices. I won't really get into this too much. But it's important, you know, especially if you're working a large team, to have some sort of standardized way that you are all assessing these attributes in the same way. Uh, you know, we're building control structures within the, our study tools, so you can say we're all going to sample these same structures. You know, maybe the first 30 structures, something like that. So we can start to see, hey, you're always assuming the foundation heights are like a foot lower than what I'm assuming. Maybe let's try again on the same page about how we're coming to that conclusion. Um, there's also important, you know, have appropriate sample size for what you need. You know, there's plenty of different tools online that you can do to say, help me uh, create a sample size. This will vary a little bit by your population size. So if you have only 100 structures in your inventory versus, you know, 100,000, yeah, okay, you're going to need more structures for, 100, for, for a, a population of 100,000, but not all that much more. You know, you, you want that 300, 500 sort of structures more or less for your sample size. And then if you have different stratifications, like, hey, I have a coastal study, I want a coastal stratification and an inland stratification, that might also help you look at, okay, uh, the coastal area has more pier and pile foundations than my inland area. 